Uh, please take a seat. And praise be to our God. Find 1 Corinthians in your Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And then uh, before we get that, we do have a question for the month. Question for the month is, uh, what is baptism? And according to an authority on the subject who is five years old, who lives at my home, baptism is when Poppy takes a bath at church. <laughs> and that is one answer. And then we'll have the answer from the catechism, which is this. Baptism is a holy ordinance to be administered with water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, signifying our engrafting into Christ and the partaking of the benefits of the covenant of grace and our engagement to be the Lord's. And that is what Marilyn and Edison did last week. They, they pictured for us um, that reality which was true of them, is true of them. That didn't make it true of them. That was a picture that it was true of them. And so that is what baptism is. You know, I'm not a real great title guy when it comes to sermons. So I just kind of throw it out and uh, I don't waste a lot of time because sermon titles don't really save anybody. The Word of God does that. So is John Piper wrong is the sermon title. Why did I come up with that? Well, it goes like this. John's a pastor, right? Well, he used to be. He's retired now. I'm a pastor. He's Baptistic. I'm Baptistic. He's Reformed and Calvinistic, and I'm Reformed and Calvinistic. And then some people on Facebook who are pastors, only some, and they are Baptistic, and they are Reformed, kind of, I guess, called him a heretic. John Piper's a heretic. A heretic? That's a pretty powerful thing to throw at somebody. You know what they did to heretics back in the day? They burned them. Because they felt that these people were eternally dangerous to people's souls based on what they were teaching. A heretic? I mean, if we're to burn a heretic, I've got probably 15 of his books in my office. Maybe we should burn my books in my office. Maybe we should burn me. Because I like his books. You know, I don't agree with everything everybody says, and no one agrees with everything that I say, which is understandable, but John Piper, a heretic? That's going a little bit too far. We're going to talk about one of his main themes of his Desiring God ministry today, which is based upon the Scripture. And it's found, of course, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and we're going to read verses 31 through 33 of that chapter. So, hear the Word of God, and uh, may God be praised this morning. Whether then... You eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And give no offense either to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of the many, so that they may be saved. That is the word of God. Let's pray together. God. May we learn and fight for joy in the face of your son, Jesus. And may lesser joys just pale in the sight of you today. We pray in your name. Amen. One of the main themes of Mr. Piper's ministry called Desiring God Ministry is that we have to, as Christians... We have to fight for joy in God because there are so many other lesser joys out there that will want to sort of steal our soul away from God himself. And so we have to have joy in God to some degree in order to glorify his name. Now remember, John Piper is a student of the late Jonathan Edwards, who pastored in the 1700s, who enjoyed the beauty of God in creation and loved the beauty of God in the Word and the face of Jesus Christ. Now, Jonathan Edwards was not perfect either. This is, gonna, this is not going to matter to you, okay? So you don't have to listen to this next sentence. But just do so anyways for the fun of it, okay? Edwards believed in what he considered a continuous creation. That meant that he believed that God was always 
His power was always having to uphold and therefore always recreating. It's a really interesting thought, but it's kind of convoluted. And then he also believed in this sort of multi-layered post-millennialism, which I know means nothing to you as well. But anyways, he wasn't always correct, but he loved the beauty of seeing God and having an enjoyment in the truths that God had declared in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, was John Piper wrong in emphasizing this idea of joy? Well, every pastor gets something wrong, okay? It could be just misproportionate to other realities. It could be a wrong emphasis here and there. No one gets it perfect, okay? And anybody who thinks they get it perfect shouldn't be doing this because then they're being arrogant. No one understands it perfectly. And so I'm sure that, like Piper is wrong like that, so am I at times. And so I've got no problem with that. The, one of the things they get said, said about is one book that he wrote was this. It's called Delighting in the Lord, you know, Meditations of Christian Hedonism. You know what hedonism is, right? Classical hedonism is when something makes me happy, that makes it morally correct. If something makes me feel bad, then that thing is morally evil. I'm the decisive factor in regard to what is truth, what is right, what is morally good. Christian hedonism is something much different. Christian hedonism is this, that whatever God states is right. Whatever God states is absolutely true. And if I don't have some degree of joy in it, I'm sinning. That's a little different, isn't it? That what he states is true. It is absolute. And if I don't have a degree of joy in what he declares, then I've got to deal with my heart. Because God is absolutely true. And people got off on that whole Christian hedonism, and they just didn't read what he was actually trying to say. With so many verses in the Bible that deal with delighting in God, there must be something about the Christian journey where we have to fight to keep our joy, not in things going well with us, not always getting our way, not always having our car start when we want it to start, not always having um, the way we want to look, whatever. We must fight for joy in something greater than our earthly existence. We must fight for something higher, more profound, which is really joy in what God has done in Christ Jesus. And we have to fight for that. Sometimes it's dull, isn't it? You can say it, I can say it. Jesus died for my sin. And my heart just sits there like this. Right? It's like ordering a hamburger at McDonald's. I love a cheeseburger. Yeah, it, like, it doesn't really, it doesn't affect me. It doesn't change me. It doesn't transform me. And so I've got to fight. I've got to fight for joy in, in, in God. Or I won't glorify Him. And Paul's already told me I have to glorify God in everything. Everything. So I've got to fight for that joy. In the book of Corinthians, it's a corrective letter. Paul has received questions and some problems from the church. And he's trying to answer them. And one of the questions goes like this. Back in their day, meat that was sold in the marketplace would have been offered to idols. And so some Christians were thinking, that's contaminated. You can't eat that. If you eat that, you'll be partaking of a, of a false religion. And then you'll have it inside of you. And, that fa and so they struggled with that idea that that meat's contaminated. Other people saying, it's meat. That's all that it is. It's not contaminated spiritually by anything. You can take it. And Paul was saying, listen, be very, very careful about how you approach this subject because we want to be able to glorify God. If your brother thinks it's a bad thing to eat, don't flaunt it in his face and then make him decide, I guess I can do it. And then his countenance and his conscience becomes destroyed. You haven't glorified God. You allowed the stake a lesser joy to take priority in your life when you should have been taking more joy in God so you could have surrendered that lesser joy. You could eat the steak at home without him knowing. But just don't do it in front of his face. And Paul's saying, so whatever you do, even if you eat or you drink, do it to the glory of God. Make much of God in all that you do so that those lesser joys, even legitimate joys, will not be dictating what you do and don't do, but his glory will. That's where Paul's heading this morning. Our doctrine this morning comes from John Piper. 
This is one of his mantras. This is his line, which some people have picked apart and found it to be wrong. I don't know how they do this, but they spend so much time trying to find things wrong with everybody. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. It just makes sense to me. You can pick every word apart. That's up to you. I'm just not going to go there. So my first question this morning is this. Is joy optional? Can't be. Not if you're going to glorify God. I mean, whatever glorifying God is, joy cannot be optional. Glorifying God is not optional because Paul's right. Whatever you do, even in your eating and drinking, give glory to him. Whatever that means, it's not optional. That means joy is not optional because if I don't enjoy something, am I going to make much of it? No. Imagine, imagine going to the, your favorite restaurant and there's an item on the menu. And you've had it before. It's just kind of ho-hum, kind of average. It's like, well, it just didn't taste all that great. Do you, do you make much of it? You, oh, that, that's the best ho-hum dinner I've ever had. Man, that average food was just the best. You should, no one does that. If you don't have joy in something, you will not make much of it. Glorifying God is making much of him. Not being forced to say, glorify God. No, by actually wanting to glory in his name. By feeling the depth of who he is, the, the recesses of his love for you. Do you know that no matter what you've done this week, Christian, what you've walked through, no matter how dark and dank it might have been, that his love was still present around you? underneath you, all around you, that it does not change because he is the El Shaddai that doesn't change from age to age. He is still the same. Do you get that? It's hard sometimes because I know when you stumble, that big guilt thing comes upon your shoulder and you think, God hates me. God must hate me. He's not like us. He's different. He's the El Shaddai. The same yesterday, today, and forever. And therefore, I can, I can enjoy him because I know truth. But I can't glorify him if I do not have a joy in him. The Westminster Confession of Faith says this. What is the chief, the chief end of man? First question in the Presbyterian Confession. What's the chief end of man? What's, why were you created? What, what's your DNA in you? To glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. You notice how those two things are present? In order to glorify Him, I have to enjoy Him. If I don't enjoy Him, I'm not going to speak well of Him. So I must need to know Him. Something about His wonder and His glory. What I enjoy most is what I'm going to make much of most. That just makes sense, right? If I enjoy this thing, I'm going to make much of it. I love, I do, I'll use the word love, because I do, to a certain degree, defined in a certain way. I love old muscle cars from the 60s and 70s. I love the colors. The Mopar colors are beautiful. Bright purple and greens and blues. And I, I love the chrome of the 1950s, those big chrome front ends. And I, I love the, the, the white letters on the black tires. I just, I, I love it. It, I, just, I like putting it together. I like working on it. I like seeing it. I can go to car shows. And that's legitimate love. But that's a lesser joy. It's a lesser joy. I need to be able to, like the people in Corinth, say, you know something? I can do away with that because I've got a higher joy in the person of God and I want to glorify Him. I want to make much of Him so I don't have to have that T-bone steak sitting in front of me. If it really, really, really offends my brother that that cow was used in a ceremony for a false god and he thinks that that meat's contaminated, I'm not going to go there. I have a higher joy. I'm going to glorify God in what I do and what I eat and what I say. That's going to take, that's going to take some work on my part. That's going to take some soulish work on my part. More so than just maybe sitting in a pew on Sunday. Because there are so many things out there that want to grab our attention, these lesser joys that really do not last. And yet, 
God calls us to glorify Him in all things. Paul would say it like this, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Peter would say, make your election sure. And it can't be a chore. If I am forced out of guilt to make much of God, it's not going to last. It's not what he's really looking for. When it, when it snows 12 inches plus at my house, and I have to get the snowblower out and the shovels, when I'm done with that, I don't come back into my home and say, you know, I want to write a poem about that. I, I think we should put music to it and sing it at church next Sunday. No, because it's a chore. I hate it. I don't like doing it. When God becomes a chore, I'm not going to be glorifying Him. Coming to worship is a chore. Oh, we have to go to sing praise to the God who loves me unendlessly in Jesus. I've got to come and I've got to hear a word about how much he's given for my soul. That's, that cannot be a burden. If it's a burden only, then, then maybe we should kind of go back and say, joy can't be optional in the Christian life. Not if I'm going to glorify God. I've got to examine my heart. I don't believe I've ever met anybody, unless things are difficult illness-wise, that would ever say, I, I, I hate eating. Oh, Hate food. Yeah. Can't stand the stuff. No, we love it. We, we, we love food. It's, it's in our, our being. We, we, we find way, new ways to cook it, new ways to eat it. We have to have boundaries to make sure we don't eat too much of it. I mean, it just eats us up. We have an appetite for it. And Paul says, even in that, my friend, even in the most basic things, glorify him. Other texts of Scripture. Let me give you a quote. This is why my heart wants to bring glory to God. My former professor, uh, Doc, Dr. Daniels, he wrote this on Facebook recently. He says this about himself. Two things I cannot measure. Two. The horrible, soul-damning evil of my own sin can't measure that. And the goodness of my Savior. Can't measure that either. Of this I have no doubt. There is no comparison between them. This divine Savior could bear the guilt of a million worlds of sinners like me. He could. He's so marvelous and glorious. And at the same time, not lose or diminish any of His glorious splendor or holiness. This is both my joy and the reason I want all people, sinners also like me, to know that he is sufficient for them. When I hear that, I want to make much of my God. The scripture says this, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your forbearing spirit be known unto all men. If you have anything to be anxious about, go before God in prayer with thanksgiving. You know, and, and pray and the peace of God will guard your hearts and mind in Christ Jesus. But rejoice. Let that rejoice be part of your package that I cannot glorify that, make much of that, which I do not rejoice or have some semblance of joy within. And I'm not talking about giddiness. I'm not talking about plastic make-believe joy. I'm talking about a deep wellness of being that even when it hurts, deep within I feel the pain, I understand it, but something underneath all of that tells me it's well with my soul. I'm hurting. i got to fight for it. i got to hold on to it. It fluctuates sometimes, but I want to glorify my God. And in order to do so, I've got to find joy in Him. The verse of Scripture this morning, delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the, de the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord. Paul's words were a, what we call a present active imperative, a command. And in the psalm, it's almost like a command. Delight yourself where? In the Lord. I've got to be honest, I can delight myself in a lot of things. I delight when things are going well. I do, it's wonderful. I delight when my body feels good. 
It's a good thing. I I delight in that. How many here delight when they go on vacation? Yeah, it's nice, isn't it? We can delight in a lot of things. And the psalmist says, would you please delight yourself in the Lord? Let your glorying in God have such an impact on you, Corinthian Christians, that you'd be willing to forsake the T-bone steak that was offered to an idol for the good of your brother. Have so much joy in God, Corinthian Christians, by glorifying Him in what you eat and drink, that you will then be willing, in certain circumstances, to take that which is actually okay and forsake it for the good of your brother. Because you have a higher joy. You have a higher desire and delight in something beyond this world. I'll close with three thoughts, then we get one more question. I have to admit that my heart languishes sometimes in this finding joy. I've I got to fight for it. And I think that's good. Because I think that keeps us balanced and modest in regard to how well I'm really doing. I glorify God. I glorify God. I gl really? I can say that a million times, but is it really happening? Am I really enjoying His truth in the face of Jesus? Secondly, I believe a lot of our sanctification struggles because we, we, we focus our following Jesus on decisions, commitment, brute will power. I've done it. I've accomplished it. Look at me. And that can just lead to self-gloating, either a theological legalism or a practical legalism. That's easy to do. It's easy to pick apart someone like John Piper because he's written so many books. Anybody can do that. That's simple. That's easy. But maybe we need to find the joy of the Lord is my strength and find the light in the face of Jesus Christ as we partake of Holy Communion this morning that he said, it's finished, my friend. You cannot add anything to your justified state. I've accomplished it all. You contribute nothing, Pastor Steve, to your right standing with my Father. I did it all. And that I can say, praise God. Praise the Lord. Richard Sibbs said it like this. There is more mercy in Jesus then there is sin in me. I'm so glad that there's more mercy in Christ than there is sin in me. And that tells me something about Jesus. He must have an awful lot of mercy. And he must be great in mercy. Because my sin is great. I know my heart. I'm not saying it's public dishonoring, Christ dishonoring sin. No, but I know my soul. I know what I think. I know what I wrestle with. Second thing I want to say about joy, and then third is this, last thing. God doesn't mind us enjoying things of this world. When God created all the non-God stuff in Genesis, what did God say about the non-God stuff? It was very good. If the non-God stuff was very good to God, how much is it going to be for me as a creature? It's going to be, a, this is great! But be willing, my friend, to remove those lesser joys if it calls for that in certain occasions and give glory to God for whatever you do, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Second question. That was the first question. Is joy optional? I don't think it is. Second question, is joy a basic element of faith? I'm not saying it's the whole of faith, but is it a basic element of faith? Well, let's think of it this way. Well, go to, first, go to 2 Corinthians, Jay. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24. Not that we lord it over your faith, Paul says, but we are workers with you for your joy. Isn't that weird? For in your faith you are standing firm. You would think, as Piper says, that he would say, that we, Lord, we don't lord it over your faith, but we are workers with you for your faith. But that's not what he says, is it? He says, we're workers for you for your joy. For, for your joy. Ministers, pastors, aren't trying to lord it over you, beat you into submission into what they think is right and wrong all the time. They're trying to bring you their workers for your joy and the glory of God for what God has done because there is more mercy in Christ than there is sin in you. That's what I want you to see. And we will partake of the table this morning. I want you to know it's done. It's finished. It's complete. You have peace with God. 
in Christ Jesus, not because of your faith, but because of Jesus. Your faith is just the instrument that the Holy Spirit has given to you to connect with Jesus. But it's Christ who saves you. You don't save yourself. Your faith doesn't save you. I'm not going to stand before God and say, my faith, my faith, my faith. My faith sometimes stinks. All right? I'm going to say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. He did it all. He completed it for me. It's done. I, I'm workers for your joy. Because your joy in God will then cause you to glorify God, make much of Him, and then you'll make choices based upon that higher joy, not always settling for the T-bone steak that is dedicated to the idol that may cause your brother to stumble. So a workers for joy in your faith. Matthew chapter 13. Oh my goodness. Parable about the kingdom of God. Christ is telling the kingdom. The kingdom of, of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid. And from his faith, oh, oh, from the joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Now, don't misunderstand the parable. <laughs> oh, there's a billion dollars in my neighbor's yard. He doesn't know about it. <laughs> I'm going to buy his house, get the property, you know, for 200000 And I'm going to, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about that when I find the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God used synonymously in scripture, when I find it, it's so valuable that for joy over it, I will sell all my lesser joys to own it, to want it, to have it. That's what Christ is telling us. And when I hear those words of my Puritan friend who has been gone since the 1500s, Mr. Sibbs, that there is more mercy in Christ how does that work? How much mercy must Christ have? I can't, you can't measure it. You couldn't put a ruler next to it. It's just unending. That must cause joy when I find that thing. Now, Jesus doesn't make mistakes. You know, sometimes when you're preaching and teaching, sometimes your brain, your words are working faster than your brain. Ever have that happen? When you're talking to somebody, you're like, what am I saying? <laughs> what does this actually mean? Jesus doesn't have that problem, okay? So Jesus doesn't say, for the greatness of his faith, he sold everything. No. He said, for the joy. I found it. I, I have it. I'm complete in Jesus. He sells all those lesser joys. John chapter 6, verse 35. Jesus said to them, I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall not hunger. Thirst. Hmm. Bread and thirst are interesting. When I'm thirsty, I don't usually don't eat bread. Right? That's kind of... But listen to what he's saying. I'm the bread of life. He's using coming and believing synonymously as the same thing. He who comes to me shall not hunger. That aimless, endless hunger for temporary lesser things that just fall apart. That's going to be gone. And he who believes and comes, he'll, he'll never thirst. That gnawing thirst will be over. I'll still thirst, but the gnawing of it, I, I'll know where to go. I know where the fountains of salvation are found. We were coming back from a place called Desolation Shelter in the White Mountains. Oh, I must have back in the 1990s with a group of students. It was one of those hot summer days, really muggy like yesterday. When you just, you have to hydrate a lot. And we were hiking back down from Desolation Shelter back to our automobiles. And all of our water was warm in our nice, fancy Nalgene bottles. They still make Nalgene bottles? They're still in, in style? I don't even know anymore. I don't care. But anyways, we had our Nalgene bottles. And the water was warm, but it was necessary because it was hydrating us because we were sweating profusely. When we got down to the bottom of the trail... There was a station down there, and there was a pump that was pumping cold, cold, ice cold water from an underground well. You know what we did with our Nalgene water? That was gone. It might have been helpful, useful, joyful for a while, but when you tasted the real thing, Nah, the, 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 less, the lesser joy had to go. The T-bone steak could be set aside because I don't want to offend my brother. And I got the real thing. I'm going to glory in God. I, I got the real water from the wells of salvation. And we celebrated. So I have to conclude that when I hear, when I hear John Piper tell me that the fight for joy, the joy in God is essential 
That makes sense to me. Because I don't glory in something, I don't make much of something that I don't enjoy. If I don't enjoy something, I don't talk about it very much. And if God is just a burden to me, if God is just this big weight on my shoulder, oh, I've got to go to church because I've got to go be obedient. You know, I've got I to read my Bible because God wants to talk to me. And I've got, then I've got to speak to him because, you know, he's so glorious. that If that's what it's, I, I mean, you're not enjoying him. His love, which we cannot measure, his love for you is always, always a white, hot love for you. Always. It can never diminish because it's in Christ Jesus and you are in Him. Read the book of Ephesians, the in Him epistle. It can never waver. Your experience of that life may waver in your taking it in by your grieving and quenching the Spirit through our sin. But His love is always, always, always white hot for you. Always. Never can, never can diminish. Because Christ said, it's done. It, it, it's done. Now we show that in our lives by, we show we believe in those things in our lives by following Him and worshiping Him. Maybe in your journey at this point, it's gotten kind of dull, burdensome, joyless, guilt-ridden, weak, apathetic, and you're like, ah, I just turn to be good, good all the time, and I can't do it. No, you can't do it. Neither can I. But maybe if we start fighting for joy in God, the joy of the Lord will be your strength. It's kind of in the Bible, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And that will then cause me to speak much of God. And then the words of certain people might actually cause me to Glorify God, and in glorifying Him, I would even adjust my behavior because He's the treasure. He has more of my heart than that T-bone steak in Corinthians here. And I can agree with my former professor, there are two things I cannot measure. The horribleness and soul-damning evil of my own sin, I can't measure it, nor the goodness of my Savior. But of this I have no doubt there is no comparison between them. This divine Savior could bear the guilt of a million worlds of sinners like me. And the glorious splendor of His holiness would not be diminished at all. This is my joy. So I don't think John Piper's wrong. I think we should fight for joy. And I think it's essential to glorify Him. Because you only glory in that which you enjoy. And may you enjoy the face of Jesus as He shares Himself with the Word and communion this morning. Let us pray. God, thank you for your word. And help us now to come and praise and glorify your name. May we enjoy what you've given to us. And may it delight our hearts this morning, we ask. We pray these things in your holy name. Amen.